Hey guys, are we live? Ding dong, knock knock. No? There we go. Sound and everything going 847, June 26, Friday, right? Somebody give me the knock knock, make sure that we can hear both sound and you can see this beautiful face here and we'll get going, right? Looking, Daniel, in your direction. Uh, all is good. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks, Chaz. Thanks, Michael. Hope everybody's having a good day. So here we go. Trade about 150 down on the Dow. Uh, things are looking a little bit red. The NASDAQ's been holding on to the green for this morning. So I feel like we've been here. This is turning into Groundhog's Day, the great Bill Murray movie. We see uh, the NASDAQ hold on in the morning, and actually we saw it yesterday. Just to talk about what we saw yesterday, you know what? The market bounced around, didn't really want to go positive or negative until the afternoon trade came in, and that's when all things broke loose right there. The buy the dippers did come in, and we actually said, watch for the buy the dippers in the morning yesterday. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Daniel. We did say, watch for the buy the dippers in the morning, and they came through. They absolutely came through uh, in the afternoon, the Dow going up about 300 points or so, the VIX pulling back down towards 30. It gave me that feeling of comfort. I actually wrote to my night trader people last night. I got, you have that comfortable feeling when that same thing happens over and over and over. Hey guy, over and over again until it doesn't. And I'm not saying it's not going to happen today, but I'm saying we're setting ourselves up yet for another one of those question mark days. It's Friday heading into a headline uh, related weekend as well. So maybe we want to be a little bit slow in terms of opening up new uh, long positions. You got uh, profits on FSLY on Fastly. Good, 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 good. I don't know if anybody saw it. Big lots this morning. They, uh, they gave actually a good outlook updated their guidance. The stock is up 10%. I'm telling you guys, the discounters, big lots, ollies, deep discounters. Ironically, I was in a big lots yesterday, kind of doing my walk down Main Street over in the northern side of Kentucky here. So keep big lots guy is they they actually gave us good guidance looking forward for the quarter. They're going to, they were one of the companies that came out and said, hey, our sales are up. Our revenue is up. Things are looking good. And why not? We've talked about it. Their stores are busy. They've got good product. They've got a lot of product because people are trying to get rid of the other retailers or trying to get rid of the product that was sitting around for three months or so. So they are doing very well. You stick with that name. You stick with Ollie's. Ollie's is going to get a boost out of this as well today. Stocks trading actually almost down to its 20-day moving average. We'll look at the chart of that, though. Let's jump into the slides. I don't want to hold us up too long because today is Free Flow Friday. We're going to be done at about 9.20 or so. I need a few minutes to prepare for my trading day here. So 9.20 is going to be our hard stop, but it's going to be a lot of time for you to ask your questions. Let's jump into those slides very quickly, though. So overnight trading and expectations. We're going straight to Free Flow Friday after that. I've actually got two stocks to trade for the next week. Two stocks that I want you to look at. And one of them, well, big lots. Come on, guys. I've been all over big lots anyway. Morning, James. And then my trading expectations, which are very short. I'll tell you what they are right now. I think that you're going to take Friday afternoon off because the trading volume is going to lighten up and we're going to head down because it's a headline risk weekend. We're going to hear so much about COVID-19 over the weekend. But what about this morning? Stocks are mixed again. NASDAQ's holding on to a little bit of a, uh, a gain right now. I'm looking at the Dow futures are one down 165 on the implied open. So you've got a situation and the NASDAQ's actually dipped into the red now too. You've got a situation that we're very familiar with in seeing the Dow trading down. This is like we saw yesterday. I don't think the buy the dippers come in this afternoon though. Um, one of the reasons is the financial stocks are pressuring the futures um, after the Fed stress, stress test yesterday. So the tests were released, we'll talk about those in just a second after the close. Those are putting additional pressure on the futures and just like yesterday, except for Carnival Cruise Line is up 2% right now, Financials and travel related, but industrials also lower this morning when I was looking across the board. Energy stocks are lower this morning across the board. So watch these because they're still playing with their 50 day. Here's the chart. I promised you, I think in the first week we started this little trip together. Um, I really promised that, uh, th that uh, we would look at this, I think in the first two days. 
Every single day, we're going to look at the S&P 500 chart because you need to know what is going on. Way to rub it in from the Hamptons. Way to rub it in. Anyhow, S&P 500 coming down to that 3,000 level right now. And we're looking at the spiders, the ETF that trades it. A little bit of a double top or whatever you'd like to, however you'd like to draw this. A little bit of a head and shoulders start to form. All kinds of things you can see here. The thing I want you to look at, though, is the volume that we had yesterday. A little bit heavier than normal. We had light volume, and I was complaining about it on Wednesday. Then the market came in with the buy the dippers. Um, I'm sorry, on Wednesday, we saw the heavy volume. Tuesday was the light volume I complained about. Now you're seeing volume drop off again. My guess is volume is going to be even lower as we head into today. The RSI right smack in the middle telling you that this market can go any direction right now. Any direction. VIX. Kind of telling us the same story. It is trying to make a decision between whether it wants to go above 35 and sustain those levels. But you can see that the close yesterday was right at that 50 day. Same thing with the RSI. You've got a market right now that literally is like on a teeter totter and it could go in a way where the VIX is going to pop to 45 or higher, or we're going to see it slip down to 25 again. And that RSI is what's telling you. And it's the same thing when we look at the, uh, the, uh, the S and P 500. That 200 day, the 50 day right there is support, but at the same time, you got the 20 day rolling over. So this is a market that we'll call in flux. Thank goodness for the buy the dippers. At the same time, really getting tired of the buy the dippers. I found some cool data that I've been pulling apart, and this is really interesting. Uh, I mentioned this to my night trader people last night in the commentary, and I hope you guys read it. Uh, actually, a tool that's that gives you the daily um, number of accounts for. Robinhood accounts that are holding certain securities like Hertz, like Carnival Cruise Line, like uh, any of these companies that have just seen these crazy rallies. And it's kind of interesting to look and see the ebb and flow of these particular account numbers um, in terms of the quantity of accounts that are holding it. It gives you a little bit of a, a look into the mind of the Robinhood investors and how quickly and how nimbly they are, are kind of moving around. And one of the things that I actually said in my commentary last night was you get the, the idea that when you're looking at this list, as you see these massive declines in accounts holding certain securities, it's almost like locusts moving from one field to another after they've eaten the, all the vegetation. Hertz right now is coming down on that list. Carnival Cruise Line, Delta Airlines, they're walking away from these stocks, which is, I think, what we expected. And it's bad news because those stocks are now trading right at those 50-day moving averages. I'm personally looking at a Carnival Cruise Line put simply because if you get that crowd out of there, that's going to be damaging for the stock. So let me go back. And Greg is actually giving you that... Uh, giving you that information about the uh, q a i am and let me give you a challenge here i'm going to give you a challenge i want you to think of some good school type of questions we're in college today i want you to think of some broad questions we'll hit your tickers don't worry and let's put the ticker symbols in the q a area today greg is going to He's gonna, he is going to approve all of those. So don't worry about that. Let's try to keep the ticker symbols and the questions in the Q and A area today. So I'm not flipping between the two and missing them, but think of something interesting today. Think about something in gold and the dollar or uh, maybe trade related, uh, whatever. Think of something that you've really been trying to figure out and I'm gonna try to figure it out with you in the Q and A today. There's your challenge. Something beyond just three or four tickers, uh, letters for a uh, ticker symbol. Think of something that is a question, and I'll, I'll hit your tickers, of course. So what about that bank stress test yesterday? We heard a lot about it. The information came out at 430. The Federal Reserve put new restrictions on the bank industry after its annual test found that banks could get uncomfortably close to minimum capital levels. Remember, these are this is the result of the financial, the Great Recession, the financial breakdown that we saw then keeping banks away from that situation where they have to, the, their capital reserves are so low that we have to have bailouts again. So the reason, then that's the reason that the Fed does this. So they found that with the coronavirus pandemic, we could get very close and a couple banks may have actually done it. So they said that the big banks are going to be required to suspend share buybacks and cap dividend payments at their current levels for the third quarter of this year. 
I think many of the banks are fine with the uh, with both of these because right now it is all about the balance sheet and trying to keep the um, trying to keep capital or cash in the doors so that they don't have to worry about burn rates as uh, the business and the recession uh, starts to hit or the recession starts to, if you will, maybe go away if we, if you look at the numbers. But for the first time in decade long history of the stress test, banks are going to have to resubmit their payout plans again later this year. They're going to have to check in again just to make sure that everything is going and I think that going well. And I think that tells you where right now the Fed is in terms of their outlook for the economy. They truly are seeing a second rebound of this and how it is going to uh, affect the financials. Where have the financials been? You know what? You've got the NASDAQ that's floating up around those new highs and you've got the S&P 500 that's tried but failed. And we can get into splitting hairs and it's not splitting hairs, but when you look at the difference between the even weighted and then the, uh, the market cap weighted indices showing you market cap weighted indices obviously hitting highs because those large companies that are pulling everybody else up by the bootstraps are doing all the work versus even weighted RSP, for example, that is below the regular S&P 500 because you know what? You've got a lot of companies that are trading as we saw in bear markets. So what are the financials doing? They're banging up against that 50 day moving average. This is truly a head and shoulders. You got a shoulder here, a shoulder here, and now we're starting to float lower. You break the $23 neckline and the financials start to go down towards $21. Volume has been lighter here as well. What I'm telling you folks is that the financials are a good short term hedge, or let's just call it short position uh, type of uh, environment right now. You can go through and find most of these banks. I'm pulling them up right now on my other screen. JP Morgan that is in the similar situation where it's bouncing against its 50 uh, day moving average. Bank of America that's doing the same thing. Citigroup that is also doing the same thing. And as these 50 day moving averages start to decline or we get, go in the rear view mirror, these banks, especially with the earnings coming up in a couple weeks, are going to go they're going to move lower and sell the rumor instead of the buy the rumor that we're normally seeing. So that's your setup for the financials. It's a situation that is very tentative. And you know that the financials are one of those sectors that the rest of the market looks at for leadership. They don't look at it to follow and it has been following. So between that and the IWM, you've got a situation where the sectors that are supposed to be leading are now lagging as we head into what's going to be a very critical, very critical earnings season. Because even though we talked about yesterday, getting the hall pass, these companies are going to get the hall pass with the uh, the earnings season. If they just say COVID-19 related weakness or we're dropping our guidance. But at the same time, people are going to be looking for anything in those reports that's going to suggest that things are worse because of the uh, the pandemic. And I think there's gonna be plenty there. So selling the rumor here in this particular situation, not buying the rumor. And at this point, I think you're gonna look at it from the perspective of, we're not gonna see a buy the news either. You're probably gonna see more selling of the news. So there's a sell the rumor, sell the news situation that could be dangerous for stocks. Um, and we're trading at these, you know, at relative highs. Jim Cramer actually came out last night and said he's worried about stocks trading where they are. It feels like we're in the late 1990s again. So just take that as you will. Take all of us with a grain of salt. Um, hopefully we'll help you make a little bit of money along the way uh, in, in whether it's protecting your portfolio or whether it's just the... Uh, the, um, you know, the speculation, making money off the speculation. Take with it. Let's go to the question and answers because that's what I'm waiting for. We've already got 24. So we've already got, and I'm trying to pull them up here, 25. How to buy to close on Robinhood. How do you buy to close on Robinhood? Michael, I have to tell you that I do not use Robinhood except for their simple, their simple stock. Uh, purchases, not trading options on them. Myself, I use all my my options trading on Thinkorswim, uh, Street Smart, the Schwab Street Smart application, and then the E Trade as well, um, and a couple of others actually. And I don't use Robinhood, so I couldn't tell you how to buy to close or buy to open on uh, on uh, Robinhood's trading platform. Out of curiosity, now 
And especially since you asked it right when we got started, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and look it up and I'll have an answer for you on Monday. So that, you know, I, th yeah, that is, uh, I think that'll be exactly what I'll do because now you've got me curious. I know if this is only phase one, do we hold beyond Tuesday? So yeah, I think you do. I think this is one of the situations where we do hold be beyond Tuesday. We hold a little bit longer term on that. Is the VIX call option still a hold AUG pick up more if it goes down? So Gary, you can't give too much information away, but yeah, absolutely. The VIX is still a hold. My goodness, we're a break even on that position right now. And a move of eight to 10% higher is going to give us a 25% win. We're almost closing out a 50% gain. And some of uh, your fellow night traders actually did uh, close out of a 50% gain. I'm not sure how they get those great prices, but the VIX call is still a hold as we move into the weekend and into next week. I think we're going to see more volatility. And in this particular situation, um, you know what? If we do see a pull back down again, we'll be buying back into that VIX or a different call strike and a different uh, expiration though. I'm assuming your trades are short-term short capital gains. Do you consider it all whether they are long or short? You know what, Don? This is a great question. Because a lot of people, and especially with the tax changes, and I am not, let me preface this by saying I am in no way a tax accountant. I rely heavily on my tax accountant for my tax advice. And <clears throat> when I do my loss harvesting at the end of the year, it's at his, the hand of his, uh, his instruction here. So when we go into this, most of the trades are short-term gains, yes. They are short-term capital gains. Um, and there have been changes to the guidelines for short-term and long-term capital gains over the last uh, couple of years, but they do fall, most of them fall into that short-term capital gains. Do you consider, so I think what you're asking is, do I consider in the holding period um, whether I want to hold it long enough to be a short-term or cap cross that line in the long-term just to get the tax benefit for it? And the answer is no. Um, I'm trading based on, the trade itself. So there, there's some situations where in my portfolio with the stock, certainly I may actually hold it a little bit longer just to make sure I get it as a long-term capital gain and get the tax rate to drop on it. Or because I can have an offsetting loss, that's going to go against it. So normally that's going to be with a stock portfolio, the option portfolio. It's very hard to, uh, to, to put a peg on it and say, yeah, I'm going to try to make something a long-term game. So I, I hope that helps. Yes. The option portfolio, short term, short term for sure. Short term for sure. Let's pull up that chart of INO. Actually, I should have pulled it up um, before. I think again, and I mentioned that I think that this is, continues to be a hold. It's seen uh, you're seeing a lot of the biotech stocks right now, a lot of the therapy stocks, therapeutic stocks right now start to take off as usual. And I wanted to uh, which strike, which expiration, Naveed. I don't have a strike or an expiration recommendation that I put out on. I know if you're initiating a new one, first of all, I'd look at maybe doing it. And this is if you're holding it already. I'd be holding it with the trailing stop and it'd be a wide one, a 10%, maybe even a little bit larger because of the jumps that the stock has made over the last couple of days here. But if I were looking at an option on this, the options are actually relatively cheap. Uh, when I was looking at the, uh, the INO options yesterday, when you're at the money, I probably want to see a stock that tends to move up, you know, somewhere around the, the 20 to 25% variety in a day. I usually go ahead and go out of money because your premiums are going to be higher. So I want to save money on or make, I guess, a little more of a value play on the convexity of an out of the money option. So hope that helps. XLY, Naveed's got all kinds of questions this morning. Still bullish or bearish on the, uh, the consumer discretionary. This is one that I believe that you have to be very careful because consumer discretionary, consumer spending is coming down. You're seeing the sentiment drop for consumers. Look at Harley Davidson. We looked at that stock yesterday. It is slipping over and rolling over to test its 50 day moving average. When you look at companies and Tiffany's a little different because we've obviously got some merger and acquisition activity that's going on, whether or not it's going to go through because the two companies keep coming back and forth saying we're not going to change our deal. But you see a slope, obviously, and even with a merger and acquisition, this is strange, except for there is now a little bit of a battle over what price is going to be paid. But a lot of those consumer discretionary companies are starting to head lower. And that means that you're seeing consumers pull back. And I don't think that's afraid that would 
you know, that's something we should be afraid of because it makes sense. So back to your question, I'm actually neutral to bearish on the XLY. I think you can find some opportunities in the sector right now, but I think it's going to be a little bit of a headwind sector or let's just call it a market laggard here. WDC, Western Digital, which we talked about yesterday. This is one of those stocks on my uh, not terrible, but troubled 33. The stock is trading below its 20 month moving average and it's 50 day. Yeah, I think a put makes sense here. Um, I think a put makes sense as you move forward into the next quarter's worth of earnings. They are, their earnings, uh, let me give you their earnings date real quickly because I wanna make sure that uh, I get this correct. And typically I don't like to buy something right ahead. July 29th, so you've got a month and a couple of days from, uh, um, 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 well, there's a nice little, I'm sorry, you've got a, uh, a month and a couple of days before their earnings, so you're going to have time for this to float lower. It is coming off of that overbought reading that we saw, but it's still kind of in the middle, volume's dropping off. I think you probably float down to the 40, uh, maybe even the 38 level before we start to see it in introduce into some buying or have some buyings that start to come up and say, yeah, I want, I'm interested in this stock. If we get quarantine, is gold going up? Gold, the metal or gold, the company Barrett Gold? I'll answer both for you so you don't have to reply. Gold GLD is going to go up, but it's, I don't think it's because of the quarantine. Um, and we're not going to, I think we have to probably accept the fact that we're not going to be quarantined again. We're going to have to tough it out and be a little more responsible about our social distancing. We're not going to sit in our houses and close businesses. Um, I think you're hearing governors both on both sides of the uh, political spectrum that are saying they really don't want to see a closed economy again. So the gold trade is going to be alive because the dollar trade, and I'll pull up the UUP, the dollar trade is going down. So you've got the dollar that's declining. And you've got uncertainty in the market bonds going up. So there's a risk on trade that's starting to form. And that always includes buying gold. It did back in 2007. It did back in early 2000. It is a defensive play. We're now hitting some of those levels that we saw in 2007. So I believe that, yes, you'll see gold move up when you look at an individual company. Barrett Gold is one of those that will leverage that move. The stock is breaking above its 50-day. I think Barrett Gold trades up above $30 in the near term here. Uh, Matthew, I just actually answered that question as well. I, maybe the two of you are, Darian, you are uh, colluding here to answer, ask the same question. What exactly is a Form 3 and what does it really mean? Form 3? Stage 3? I think you're going to have to, you may have stumped me here. Um, Form 3? I think you're talking maybe about my hedging levels. Level 3 hedge is what I normally talk about. I'm going to assume that's what that is, Kelly. A Level 3 hedge and we're actually putting together right now a program on this, my three levels of hedging, one, two, and three. Level one being a trailing stop loss on positions that are positive. Number two being inverse, the application of inverse ETFs in your portfolio to kind of give a subtle hedge to the market, like SKF, which I mentioned, or the SDS shares. And then level three hedges using out of the money um, options, out of the money options to actually hedge a portfolio. Usually that's done because you can use out of the money and cover a larger amount of your portfolio. They just had Nassim Tlaib on CNBC earlier this morning talking about he would not be in this market without a level three hedge. He doesn't call them level three. He calls them wings, um, hedges that are way out there on the standard deviation in terms of moves. So Nassim Tlaib, I think most of you probably know who he is. Uh, the Black Swan is the he, his uh, book that he wrote about, and you know he writes about market crashes and how you can, now he focuses on how you can protect yourself through market crashes. So that level three is a uh, an out of the money put, usually one of those wing puts that gets you into the situation where if the market pulls back 20%, you have an insurance policy that kicks in, like your house burning down. But it's not, obviously, you can't guarantee insurance on a portfolio. Is SPG, Sharon Plow, is it ready for a, uh, another move up? Or I'm sorry, I always say Sharon, I always say Sharon Plow, and it's Simon Property Group. Carson, or Karsten, 
this is one area that concerns me a little bit. Simon Property Group is big commercial real estate, especially in New York City. I love that it hit its 50-day moving average. I don't love the fact that their fundamentals of their business <clears throat> are going to get stressed over the next couple of, not even months, the next couple of quarters. If we have another round of COVID-19 coming back, you're going to have people that are not going to be going into office buildings. I have an office in downtown Cincinnati that I walk to. Um, it's that close. And I have an, and it's in a neat little area of town down and over the Rhine on Main Street, got a nice little view and everything. I haven't been there in three months, even though it's been open. Um, I think you're going to find the same situation with uh, the properties that are owned by Simon Property Group. The stock trading at $65 and its 50 day moving average is probably as good a chance as you're going to get for it to bounce a little bit here. And maybe it bounces up to 72 or 73 where the 20 day, watch that 20 day moving average on it because it's a trader's trend line. The REITs right now, if you look at the IYR, which is the EPF that tracks REITs, <clears throat> outside of Simon Property Group, also running into the same issue, 50-day moving average. I think you're seeing a little bit of a sell the news on the reopening. Here is your buy the rumor as we were reopening, and now you've got to sell the news. And guess what? That looks just like the XRT, where you go in and have the same rally. XRT went up above the 200-day. Everybody got a little more excited about the XRT. Now, pulling back even further, and get, it'll be testing the 50-day moving average at some point as well. Hope that helps you. Uh, I don't think that it's a huge trade to the upside bouncing off the 50-day. I would expect it to break below. What are my thoughts on Tesla and Amazon shifting up or down? Amazon has been a little bit quiet. When you look at the uh, the the um, the retail, it's kind of slowed down from that voracious growth that we saw in April. Um, it's but it's still obviously large and in charge is what I would call it. The 20-day moving average, a trader's trend line, firmly in place here. I think Amazon continues its trek higher, and this will be a $3,000 stock in very short order. Tesla, similar situation. These are two names that every portfolio should probably have um, in terms of a foundation. They are the new technology blue chips. Even though Tesla has a little more volatility trade to it, Tesla has now gotten to the point, obviously, with their market cap that it's a serious company when they're outweighing Ford and a few others. On that note, Ford, one of the names that uh, has been making its uh, way to the list of the Robinhood accounts that are being that are dropping it. Uh, and notice what's happening with Ford. And they've got their announcement of the new pickup truck that's coming out, uh, the F-150. Um, this is kind of an interesting, again, an interesting dynamic with the Robinhood trading account uh, information that I'm looking at. Ford is one of those names that's been dropped very quickly. But anyhow, back to it. Tesla, I think, and Amazon continue their technology blue chip march higher. Um, and they'll have their bumps in the road. And you, I think you buy these when you get a nice big pullback. I think you, it's hard to buy these when they're sitting at their highs as they are right now. So keep an eye on them in terms of, there it goes, it finally came up. $1,000 also, if you look at Tesla here, round numbers, the more zeros after the, the first digit, the harder it is to break through. Tesla has been trying to break through that 1000 Once it does, it's going to make a quick run up to 1100 so uh, let me see. What can we expect in the indices if we get more stimulus? Ruby, this is a great question. Let's cover three different things that you'll expect. Gold's going to go higher if we get more stimulus. The dollar's going to go lower if we get more stimulus. And you're going to see the S&P 500. Some of the consumer discretionary might get a little bit of a boost, um, but you're going to see a little bit of a bump right now. It is the Fed staying in charge of the uh, of the the markets, and in this case, it's not so much the Fed doing it through liquidity by saying, "Hey, we're just going to start buying bonds." LQD, you should be watching on that because LQD is literally like the portfolio that they're purchasing. Nice, steady, low volatility increase that we're seeing right now in the LQD. And notice how when the Fed started to announce it, "Hey, we're getting active with it now." You you maintain the same trend that we had before the COVID nineteen took over. I can't believe I haven't made this a little larger for you guys. I'm sorry. The uh, There we go. The bars. 
But we now have the same trend in the LQD that we saw before the outbreak, the pandemic outbreak, and that's because the Fed is there. To answer your question, though, you're going to see the S&P 500 trade with a little less volatility and start to trend a little bit more. That is not going to last for the whole summer. They're saying that we could see that in July. I think you're going to see people looking at that as another Band-Aid on a bullet wound, to put it bluntly. And it'll probably give you a couple weeks worth of purchasing where we're really going to take out. And remember, right here is where the Fed said we've got a backdrop, March 23. We took off for two or three weeks and then started to trade sideways. You'll get the same thing. So James's son is looking... He trades and is looking for a put on INO. What say you, CJ? I say INO has gone up three days in a row, and we've already looked at the chart, so we all know what it looks like. This is a situation where I think a put, usually when I have a stock that has done a made a move like this, and in this case, it's doubled in three days, 100% return in three days. I look at it from the perspective of a lottery ticket if I'm buying a put. I am not expecting anything to happen because the stock could go up another 50% over the next following two days. But I don't go too far out of the money on this. Usually, James, I typically look at something that's going to be maybe five or 10% out of the money because now this stock is in a situation where if it pulls back uh, 10 or 20%, people are going to be looking to buy back into it because they missed it and the volume is heavy. Now, wasn't the case back in March when we saw I know do the same thing, shot up. And in this particular case, guess how much it went up? It was up 200%, almost 300%, and then came back down to the $5 level. So in this particular case, if you'd gone out and bought a 10 strike, and the 10 strike is going to be expensive because the premium is high because of the this exact move. These are out there. These are six, six Sigma type of moves. Um, so the options start getting priced for Six Sigma moves, including the puts. So I think that you look at it from the perspective of maybe you buy something around a 20 or uh, maybe maybe even go down to a 15 and hope that it's look at it from a lottery ticket perspective. Don't bank the farm. Don't put mama's egg money in it either because she'll be mad. IBM. I was just looking at IBM because of their whole cloud play, and they've obviously stopped. They've said that they're stopping and work with the police department. IBM has been one of those companies that continue. It's a perpetual disappointer, if you will. This is an example of a company that has been trying to um, reinvent itself for the last decade and has been unable to do it. If you look at the monthly chart of IBM, and this is one of those, again, here you go. There's 2013, we can go back to 2009. You got a bump that took it out of the market, the 2009, 2010 bottom. And then the stock just topped out in 2013 and has not done anything except for go down. It has been in a bear market since 2013. You can see with the 20 day moving average, that's a 20 month. So it stayed in a bear, a bear market since then. I don't have a great outlook for IBM. Another one, and I'll skip to the, uh, I'll skip to one of the stocks that you're going to see here in a few seconds. Whoa. I'll skip, skip to one of the stocks that you're going to see in a few seconds, which is GE. Same situation. I'm looking at GE right now, and the stock has bounced around, gone from six up to eight, and just kind of done nothing. And they, they both suffer from the same thing. And GE right now, their, uh, their aerospace side is really getting pummeled here. For some reason, we're not going to see the chart of GE right this second. But if you look at GE, let's pull this over because our for some reason, the, uh, the E signal is not being kind to us. It doesn't like it. If you look at GE, guys, GE has been trying to turn itself around for years and years and years. Now it's gone from 850 down to 650 on this pullback, breaks below its 50-day moving average. GE is going down to 6, maybe even 550 here in the next month or so. And it's the exact, exact type of situation that we see with um, IBM. It's a large company that has tried to reinvent itself over and over GE started going down in 17, 13 for uh, IBM, 
Stay away from these stocks unless you're selling them. Do you use any day trading indicators to predict big SPY moves? If so, which are the best? I use a combination of five minute bars on Jim on um, the S&P 500. I usually look as Jerry knows on the IWM though. Uh, I watch the five minute bars along with the standard devi deviation reading for the last 20 five minute bars. So it's a, it's more than an hour, almost two hours worth of uh, five minute bars on that. So I'm looking at the overbought, oversold on that, as well as the standard deviation. If I see the uh, IWM go flat, for a two hour period where the standard deviation gets low in turn and low is a relative term. Low is based on the last two weeks worth of trading that reading. That's when I start to jump into uh, a directional play on day trades for the IWM. And I usually do them on the IWM because they're much more uh, sensitive and they move around a lot faster. Compare the S&P 500 to the IWM move on any given day and it's almost two times for the IBM or IWM. So you can use the same indicators five minute bars, RSI, and a combination of that with the standard deviation reading for those five minute bars for 20 bars. And you'll have a nice, nice little uh, volatility predictor for the uh, the underlying there. Nike, mm, this is a difficult one because they came out with numbers that weren't great. I'm telling you that Nike's gonna come down, pull itself down. Let's go to the daily chart. Um, Nike's gonna pull itself down. We're gonna see it open up. I think we were three or four percent lower right now. I think five percent uh, down at that ninety-five. The fifty-day moving average is where it starts to look attractive again. Don't like the lower highs here as a technician. I like the stock. You know that. I don't like the lower highs. Fifty-day support is going to be key for Nike here. They are one of the best, if not the best, organic companies out there right now that it, that you can uh, purchase. So, in other words, they're a company. If you look at McDonald's, if you McDonald's is relatively organic um you know they are a company that is more of that grassroots they started everything um it's one of the best out there i think that when you look at them from everything from their social policies to how they run the company it's just it's a gold standard for retail i like nike i see that they're busy when i do my walk down main street i think they're a buy when they uh, dip down here where can i go to see see aftermarket activity in the evening on the weekend. Usually you can get that through your broker. Um, TD Ameritrade does a pretty good job. Schwab does an actually really good job of it through their Street Smart uh, application. Usually you wanna do that through, if you just wanna look at a price, you can look it up on Google as well. Look up on Google's finance area and they give you pre-market and uh, evening activity. The other one that I'll use for futures alone is Bloomberg. Um, I've got Bloomberg account, so that's, that's one. You have to pay for it, but it's a great application or a great uh, source. Do I follow the CFTC's uh, commitment of traders? I do. I absolutely do. It's kind of a secret one, Jim. You don't talk about it that much. CFT, for those of you that don't know, the uh, CFTC is a commodity um, the, the arm of the commodity, you know, regulating area. They're, they're like the OIC for options here, or I'm sorry, Oprah for the options. And they put out a weekly report that gives you the balance and it breaks it down by size and buyers. So it's buyers, large, small, it, it's supposed to be individual, uh, firm, and then uh, large market maker, or I'm sorry, market makers, and then firm, and then it's buy or sell. It's a great, great resource because it can give you an idea of what smaller traders are doing in the futures market. And it's everything from oil to gold to S&P 500 to NASDAQ futures, anything. You can go back and look at 20 or 30 years worth of data with it too. And you can put together what Jim is referring to as a net balance or a net short net long, net short uh, position based on that data that can tell you how long or short the market makers are, how long or short the large firms, how long or short individual investors are. You can put it together to get a great idea of where the smart money is positioned and you are correct, Jim. Uh, they also cover the VIX options or the VIX futures. You are correct. The reading is now the most short. The smart money is prepared for a large decline in the market. I, I think when you combine that along with the chart that we looked at yesterday for the uh, investors intelligence bull bear, it is a sign that, you know what, you've got the smart traders positioned, they're bearish, and you've got the individual investor, the man on the street that is as bullish as they've been since February. That's a bad, bad, bad combination. Um, I'm going to do two more 
and then we're going to have to cut our time short. I've got 52 questions. Greg, I can't read what you're putting, but we definitely have some questions we're going to have to answer over the weekend for some commentary for everybody up on uh, up on the website, Monday morning. i got to take Dean because he always asks good questions. Dean, what do you think of a naked put on a Home Depot at a low point since I don't – so you do want to own it and you want to get the premium. I – at the risk of, and I'm not giving a recommendation, a direct recommendation, let's look at the chart of Home Depot. I won't give you a price or a strike, but I can tell you that whenever I know I want to buy a stock, uh, you can do it one of two ways. I can either put a limit order in at 225 on Home Depot and say, wow, if it pulls down there, I really want to buy it, or I can sell the put and get the premium. And if I don't get, if I don't, uh, if I don't have get exercise if I don't have to purchase those shares those and you're gonna have to buy 100 shares so it's twenty two thousand five hundred dollars and that's what a lot of people don't understand when they do a, a put sell um, a, a put sell strategy well I'm gonna sell it and I'm gonna collect the premium and then when they find out oh my gosh I have to put twenty two five into it yep absolutely your liability in that trade if you sell the 225 is Two thousand or twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars, one hundred shares at two hundred and twenty-five dollars a share. So you always be careful when you're doing it. It's a little uh, easier if you want to do it with GE, and it's a five dollar. Obviously, you've got a cheaper, cheaper uh, outlay that you've got, but you're going to pull in less premium here. Let me get back on point. <clears throat> a put sell is a great way to buy a stock at a predetermined price and get paid. In, in the form of collecting premium until it hits that price. A lot of funds that I, uh, I deal with or I talk with use that exact strategy as a nice option strategy to help lower the price of their portfolio. The other side of that, Dean, and everyone else, is you can use a, a, a covered call strategy once you own it. So if you own it at 225 because you bought it at a put sale, you can start writing the 240 calls um, against that 100 shares and you collect premium. And if it doesn't hit two, 240, you get to put that in your pocket. And then you write the 245 and you put that in your pocket. And then eventually it get calls away, but you get to name your price. I want to buy it at 225 and I wouldn't mind selling it at 250. Boom. It's easy. Options should be part of everybody's uh, strategy or their 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 toolbox, if you will, because it's very simple to do something that is not speculative, but it's income generating and portfolio managing. Um, Zachary, airline CEOs are going to the White House. If bailout occurs, should the stocks fall or rise? You know what? I. I'm going to be surprised if there is a, I think the White House, and this is me just pontificate. This is me up on my soapbox for a second and giving you, I'm opining. I don't think you're going to see many more bailouts coming towards the airline sector. I think you're going to see the government working with them to try to control costs somehow, to cut, help them out with unions, to do whatever they need to do. Um, I think people don't like the idea of continued bailouts. It might happen. Um, but I have to say that right now, I think that the stimulus package is going out to individuals. And especially if you listen to Mark Cuban, I love the way he says we need to stimulate the, the, uh, the consumer, but do it in a way so that they're spending money at the local level on small businesses because it all comes back into the same stream of cash at some point. Um, Who's in charge of the Fed? Didn't Trump consolidate it into the, it's always been as part of the Treasury Department. Um, the Fed is, you've got the secretary of the, the, the Jerome Powell is in charge of the Fed, the chairman of the, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank um, is part of the, the or the, the, the central bank, if you will, part of the Federal Reserve here. So Jerome Powell is your man. He is the chairman. So is, uh, or so was, Mr. Sinatra, right? He was the chairman. <laughs> All right, guys, we're at 930. I said that I was going to get through. Thoughts on Ring Central? Like it? I, I'm going to zoom through how to play the VIX calls. You go a little bit out of the money. You buy some time. Brighter bars, please. I already got to that. Boy, we've got a lot. Sorry about this, guys, that I didn't get down to them. I'm going to go back over and just look at you for a second. 930, the markets are opening right now. 
uh, Dow's down 200 right now. Right out of the gate, we're down 200. When you and I started talking, we were down 150. I think this is the way the market goes. Light volume in the afternoon trade, but people are going to get out of the way of the weekend. So watch yourself. Jerry, there's a good trade in the IWM this afternoon too. If you pay attention after one o'clock, you're going to see an increase in the uh, an increase in the volume, and that's going to translate into an increase in the volatility in a move. So there we go. It is, Anthony, very good point. It is its own. The Fed is an independent, and that's why you saw Trump going at it. Jerome Powell was put there, was was not put there, but was lauded as he's still going to stay. Trump was asking Jerome Powell to step down for some time. Powell reports to Senate, to the Senate Committee of Finance. That's who he reports to. He can't be really fired. He has to step down. We can get all of this into uh, another discussion that would be fun, actually, next week. Have a great weekend, you guys. Enjoy your trading for the day. Make some money. And as always, I wish you the best trading success. I've got to get busy trading myself. Have a good one.